Hey, what's up everyone? This is Keats, and this is the production walkthrough for my track Espresso, which is part of my debut EP, Shade, and that is out now everywhere on Mousetrap. Uh, I wrote the first like intro, build up, and drop all in like one sitting in one Ableton session. Uh, I was really inspired by some sound design session that I had uh, earlier that day, and um, you know, just everything was clicking, and all the pieces were falling into place, and I was able to write this you know the first drop and you know a good intro or whatever and i was really really stoked on it so so and to get into like the sound design session that started the whole idea um this is a bus grouping from the original like version one project file and the actual sounds kind of stemmed from uh, an old alan moore track i was listening to it and i thought it'd be fun just as an exercise to try and recreate uh one of the drops in one of his older songs. So I'll play that now and kudos to you if you guys recognize it. So uh, obviously the espresso lead is recognizable there and uh, the fills are also recognizable. They're just rearranged differently. Um, this serum patch is nothing too crazy. It's pretty static, uh, no pun intended. Um, it's just a wavetable with some sync, the flanger filter, and some zero square distortion filtered, uh, OTT, and EQ that's shelving the high uh, harsh frequencies um, and then in the chain itself, we've got some parallel distortion, which I do a lot, and some subtractive EQ afterwards to kind of tame uh, the messiness that comes from that. Um, I do this a lot with a lot of my sounds where I will get it as close to, you know, what I want with just the synth, and then I will then apply, a, you know, a ton of post-processing. Um, so let's see, there isn't, uh, yeah, no automation there to show really uh, the square bass sound underneath it. Uh, let's see if I can. That's almost just like a, well, yeah, it's, it's basically like a BSOD style square bass with some resonance, uh, EQ, OTT, uh, distortion, a little tiny bit of downsampling to give it a little bit more crunch. And then uh, Ableton Saturator and a Camel Crusher and uh, these compressors aren't doing anything because it's an old project file. <laughs> uh, and then a glue compressor, soft clipping the crap out of it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the serum patch for this little wobble thing, uh, but I can tell you that it's basically just a, uh, like a saw bass sound with a low pass filter sweep and a little bit of pitch uh, bending. And that little like glitched out reduxy wobble, um, I do this in a lot of my tracks where every four bars or every eight bars, I will apply an effects chain. I'll turn it on and turn it off just for like the fill, just to add variation. So in this instance, there's like some vintage reverb to give it more space. Uh, the redux, the saturator is automated. Um, and the LFO tool creates like the uh, choppy, uh, well, LFO sounding effect. And then uh, we've got some imaging afterwards to just kind of focus the sound. And then I think this main bass right here is just a variation on this. A lot of the times I'll duplicate a same, I'll duplicate a sound and then make some tweaks to the patch to try and get a same but different um, sound. And that also helps uh, from a mixing standpoint. That way, it well one it saves you time because you don't have to start all over, uh, but uh, yeah, it's I like doing things this way, and it's actually easier to kind of come up with uh, new variations that don't fall far from the tree, like kind of the, you know apple falls far from the tree or whatever that analogy is. Um, but uh, it helps with mixing, and it helps me come up with cooler fills, and it helps make the core idea a bit more interesting faster for me. Uh, so after I made that and was inspired by that, I then rearranged the uh, drop, or rearrange this into the espresso drop that uh, you're familiar with now. It would help if I turn the sounds on. 
So that's that was like version one of the espresso drop, and then you know four or five versions later, uh, this is the more mixed down, polished version. Um, so I had mentioned earlier that this song was written, you know, uh, or well started like you know two years ago. Um, so two years ago, I had a different PC build, and by the time that this section was written, and I had the drums playing, uh, my CPU was definitely struggling. So I constantly had to resample those sounds and process them, freeze and flatten, process them, you know, et cetera, et cetera, repeat um, to get exactly what I wanted. And um, this is the last iteration. Um, this is basically like the mixed down version uh, for the master that you guys are all familiar with. So I can play, I can solo this, all the synths and play it right here. So um, I feel like a lot of the time with these harsher, like distorted, staticky leads, there's a really fine line between, um, you know, in your face and present and overbearing. Um, it's tricky with these types of sounds because they're, you know, really bright and distorted. And I feel like uh, a lot of times in other genres and also in Electro House, um, it's really easy to just go too overboard uh, with the distortion and it's kind of like fatiguing on the ear. So one thing that was tricky for this mix down for me was to try to really draw that line and get a good balance uh, between the two. And I, I think I achieved it. I'm, I'm definitely happy with uh, how it sounds. Um, so after rendering that out a handful of times and processing it, I can just show you guys some Camel Crusher, some very, uh, actually, this Camel Crusher isn't even doing anything. It's just probably raising the uh, bass volume. And actually, now that I think about it, it looks like the original audio file is clipping in some places, so that's what this is doing. This is uh, soft clipping the output of the original file, so it's not clipping the input of any of the other effects chains. So then, uh, you know, cutting out the lows to make room for the sub bass, uh, some mid side EQ, cutting out some of the low mids of the mud, and adding a little bit more brightness. And then this is just kind of like a Swiss cheese. Uh, subtractive EQ in the mid and side to really focus the sound with the rest of it. And then this is also cutting out uh, some harsh frequencies around 4700, which is a really sensitive uh, range for human hearing. I don't always do that. It's just, you know, this is a really bright lead and I thought it needed it. So then here we've got the square base layer. Let's see if I can just solo it. And uh, I use R bass a lot on stuff to add more presence in the low end. Like this is kind of a thin sound without it. I'll turn off the effects and this almost sounds like nasally. And then with the R bass and max bass and some EQ, actually this EQ is literally doing nothing. It's just got more body and it kind of has more, well, it's got more mid range because of it. Uh, let's see, the main bass sound I think is. Well, there's a lot going on with the main bass sound. So this is just a, you know, a resampled version of this serum. Uh, but I've got this fill maker here, which has like a, a lot of automated parameters, a flanger, an overdrive, a filter frequency delay. Um, and that's just used for me when I want to make fills, like right here. So I don't have to... Um, uh, you know, make a whole nother effects chain or whatever, which I do in different parts of the song uh, for specific reasons, which I'll get into later. Um, but let's see, uh, Max Bass again. Uh, it's I lowered the side image of this because this um, the main like staticky stab is pretty wide, and uh, I don't want the bass uh, sounds to be getting in the way of that width, so I narrowed the image. Um, some compressor side chain, some nothing too crazy. I don't even think there's really any like trash to or anything on this. Um, yeah, and some multiband afterwards to tame the uh, sub bass, so the I'm getting consistent peaks in the leveling. Um, 
this right here is a rendered version of that uh, effects that I showed you in the previous, the old bus. And this is just, uh, I do this a lot with, um, with sounds that have uh, very heavy effects processing on them because uh, sometimes when it's in MIDI, it's kind of hard to see uh, exactly what uh, the level is and it's hard to tell if you're peaking or not. So I'm a visual learner, so I like bouncing things to audio as quick as possible. Um, I think it helps my writing process and it definitely helps me uh, nail the mix down, in my opinion. Um, this little yoy. This is like a little weird stab thing that I got from uh, taking a filter with high resonance and putting it before a saturator on like just a hip hop sub bass preset and, you know, smash the crap out of it. And uh, yeah, I think it sounds pretty cool. Uh, so let's see, that's basically it for the drop. There's a couple other random fills here. There's the operator synth that I froze. It's like a, I don't know, <laughs> some more FM yoy stuff. And let's see right here. That's just like a filtered saw or square wave. Um, let's see. Okay, so I can get into, I'll play the intro. We can go over a bit of the drums now. This perk fill I was a really big fan of and it was a happy accident. Uh, just an example of doing hot swap sampling in a sampler and finding something, you know, getting lucky with the sample selection. Uh, you know, chosen from the finest selection of Vengeance percussion of 2012, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it's just got a saturator, a camel crusher on it, and uh, I panned it left and right. Um, I like throwing in little recognizable phrases like this because um, a lot of the time it's just that like one little thing that you can hear like in a club or in a mix that like you instantly recognize it's like oh it's this song coming in I love this song um, so I always try and add like little recognizable bits into my songs um, and uh, I think it's uh, important for finding something because like once you have that like little nostalgic bit in there that someone uh, attaches to that you know they listen to the song they really like it you know it's that it's like that quick recognizable factor in the beginning of the song um, and I feel like a lot of good music has that one thing in the beginning that instantly helps you recognize oh it's this song so I tried to do that in all my tracks and then in this track there's a whole lot of effects which I'll go over or I'll try to get over most of them so in this track, pretty much throughout the entire thing, there is this one FX out, which uh, was a recording, uh, I think it was either from my Moog or it was just a sample. Uh, in my previous production walkthrough, uh, I explained that I really like to take uh, pads or loops or percussion and loop like a bar or even less than that. And then I'll mess around with the transpose and the beat algorithm or the pitch algorithm and kind of create a uh, atmosphere or a texture that kind of goes around uh, and moves around in the background of the song. And so that's exactly what this is. Um, I've got a filter here, an effect, uh, audio effect rack to, uh, you know, automate the volume overall of the track, uh, you know, so it doesn't like go get too in your face because you don't want an element like this to be too loud in the song. You don't want it to distract from the lead elements. You want it to complement them. So like over time, the Redux, uh, let's see. Oh, <laughs> over time, the Redux stays completely the same. Let's see, uh, but it, yeah, this is what it is. So it's filtered out um, as the song progresses. And we've got some overdrive going on as well, kind of to add presence as tension rises in the track. So like right here before the main drop. And all these like risers you hear in the background are just one shots that I've edited. This is just some white noise that I've made in Operator Pros, rendered out the sidechain.
so the psycho violin stabs um that kind of was just made in the initial creative inspiration um i thought it'd be really cool to add those as a fill uh it's like borderline cheesy but i think it's uh i think it fits well like it's not you know it's not too cheesy it's um i don't know I'm, <laughs> it's one of my favorite fills that i've made um but uh so instead of like ripping the actual sample from the old movie or whatever that old black and white horror movie is i figured this sound is commonplace enough and it's used basically in all modern horror nowadays um so i figured i was like well i could probably just recreate this in contact so i actually just used uh the like symphony strings contact library uh i made some staccato string violin slides um and recorded them out and like i was saying since this was originally in uh, my old pc i don't have the actual contact uh preset or you know configuration but i do have the original recording so i can play that right here so i like none of these are actually on the grid um i kind of edged them out you know to give it a more human feel i do that a lot of the time with fills and whatnot because uh, if things are always on you know right on the grid it just you, you can almost always hear it and uh it's kind of takes away any excitement um i shouldn't say any excitement but like it's just it's like it's lacks a bit of like of that human humanness to it the little mistakes or you know it's not exactly on time so uh with this this chain right here is basically just a it's a reverb and some ott and overdrive and some transient shapers to really accent the initial strike of the violin and to add brightness and the reverb is to just put it in a room so i can a b how it sounds without it, with and without it it's a pretty night and day difference obviously but then if i pair that with the rest of the risers and effects that i made Uh, the reason why the effects are underneath this at the same time is because without the effects, it just kind of it sounds like too abrupt or too out of place. Let's see, moving on with the track. The drums in this track are pretty simple. I would say there isn't anything too crazy going on. This uh, little percussion loop, actually, I can solo the drums. Um, yeah, the, the drums in this track are really all just sample selection. I, I don't think I'm doing any crazy processing on anything. Yeah, the kick drum, just cutting a little bit of mud out of it with Pro-Q2. Oh yeah, and this is, so going back, another throwback, so I was saying how this is an old project file. Um, I no longer bust my kick and sub on the same thing uh, for mixing purposes, because I in this song i get away with it because the only thing i'm doing is filtering it out during like breaks or fills or whatever um but nowadays i will have my sub processed separately from my kick because i treat them differently uh in terms of compression and you know all, all, several different others um the clap uh nothing crazy some mid-side eq uh and a glue compressor uh, this clap, I believe, is just something that I made. Uh, if you've seen any of my live streams, uh, my the, the way that I make my drums is I'll start in MIDI and I'll layer them with separate MIDI tracks and I'll adjust the start times of the samples to make sure that they're in phase with each other and that ba doing it that way basically takes care of any of like the punchiness or the loudness or whatever it is. Like I don't, I typically don't. Um, compress my drum samples um i'm trying to think what else uh yeah i mean it's 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 mostly like it's mostly just sample selection um as weird as or as weird or as unexciting as that is so let's see moving into the breakdown So these build bases right here are just a reiteration of the main base and one of the other serum patches in the main drop. 
so there's a lot of things going on during this breakdown that I'll try and cover. So first, the build base, um, it's a different pattern uh, than you know during the drop, and it's not in the same bus as the drop because um, the dynamics of this section are totally different than the drop. The drop is you know supposed to be really loud and in your face, and this is a little uh, farther back and more dynamic with everything else that's uh, going on and the new pads and new risers that are starting to come into the track. So um, let's see, nothing too crazy here. Some filtering out uh, for when I need to wash things away, uh, for when the risers and stuff come in, for when things are building. Um, there's a whole lot of effects processing on this build base chain, and that is all just stuff that relates to um, kind of like mixing this section out. So I will solo it. So you can hear over time, things get filtered, reverb gets added, and I'm adjusting the volume um, using the wow filter to, you know, automate and have it fit in the context of the mix. So this riser right here, um, interesting thing behind this so this scratchy lead um it's one of those things it's kind of like you you don't hear it until or you yeah you don't recognize it till it's gone so if i take out the drop or if i take this out of the drop or the the break it's it's kind of empty <laughs> It's just another interesting layer to add to everything. Some effect sweeps going on there. This Moog riser was a lot of work. Um, this was originally recorded like a, a pulse wave recorded out of my Moog. So without any of the effects processing, it sounds completely different. Just a good old, good old, <laughs> good old pulse wave. Um, let's see. And then uh, on this, the main things that are doing all the work here are the serum effects. Lots of automation with the like the distortion um, to add presence over time. The hyper drive or whatever this thing's called. Uh, I automate the mix size on the. Um, on the unison uh, to kind of have the sound spread out as the build progresses and uh, the dimension mix also gets changed over time um, this verb out is just a washed out effects chain um, and this auto pan is also uh, moving so in the beginning it's like choppy kind of like a very staccato almost like a drum roll and then I automate it down as the pitch is being increased by this uh, kilohertz uh, pitch shifter. And I use this over the Ableton's version in this particular instance because uh, this does a better job of keeping things in phase. Ableton's does not keep it in phase, but that can add that can lead to some like cool creative um, results. So it's kind of just like, it depends on the scenario of what you want to use it for. Uh, I believe there is, let's see, where is it? Hmm. And solo some of the uh, sound effects. This white noise stab that's going on on the downbeat is just to emphasize and add more tension. This is like a laughing kind of sounding uh, white noise perk uh, with the autumn, you know, auto pan automated and the wow filter kind of opening things up as uh, it progresses towards the apex. So 
So right here in Synth 1, there's some interesting things going on. Um, this is like the resurgence, and that's like a teasing what the second drop progression is going to sound like. And then underneath it, I've got like a snare roll. And there's obviously a bunch of other sound effects and stuff underneath everything to add, you know, a, a lot of tension. Um, and then everything, you know, comes together uh, right at the second drop. Uh, with the snare roll, I do this a lot for other songs. I'll just change up the sample, but I like to automate the decay and the sustain of snare rolls, especially towards the end. Um, it kind of shorten it. Well, if you're reducing the sustain and the decay, you're shortening the sample time. So um, it's kind of like making things sound more staccato. And um, I just think it sounds, it's like kind of adding a human element to things. A little bit of auto pan at the very end to um, kind of move things to the sides to allow uh, the build up bass to be more in focus. Because this snare is like taking up a lot of the same frequency range that the main bass sounds are. So the louder this gets, the more I have to pan this to the left and the right so it doesn't uh, get in the way of the rest of it. Uh, a little boost in the mid-range, around 200 for some more presence. Um, and then this filter is just uh, shelving off the highs when all the other bright stuff is coming in during this uh, last build. <laughs> So this second drop um, is just uh, in all of my songs. I try to, you know, make a, a B very a different variation on the first one. Uh, I want it to sound similar, but I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want it to be boring. So uh, I'll try. It, it's just kind of like sitting down and experimenting and figure out figuring out uh, a new um, progression that's, you know, same but different. Uh, so that's what the second drop is. And actually, I can play you guys a um, a different variation on the second drop of... This didn't make the final cut, but I still think it's like a little cool idea. And I can explain why I didn't... Uh, why it didn't make the final cut uh, after I play it. So, I like that a lot, um, but when I was trying to uh, do the song arrangement, uh, I just couldn't make it fit. Like, it sounded it sounded good after the build, um, but I thought that another 16 bars of this just sounded a bit, would just kind of got stale. Um, and so instead, I came up with this progression, which I think is a little easier to follow. There's a little less going on, and uh, specifically in Electro House, uh, I know this genre is all about complexity, but sometimes it can be a bit too much, and sometimes it's just hard to follow, and people will lose interest. So I think keeping keeping things simple but having good sound design is kind of like the there's there's a good balance between the two. Um, so with this second drop, so the first eight or the first sixteen bars are something totally new, and then the last sixteen bars are uh, is like a newer version of the B section on the first drop. With some slight variation. And I thought that this, this section going into this, it just sounded, it just flowed a lot better. Cause like I, at first I was trying to have this be uh you know here and just it, it wasn't this part was not connecting well with this and so I, instead of trying to force it or you know make it something that it wasn't i just uh you know came up with this progression instead which i like a lot and i think it sounds good um so i'm trying to think uh let's see that's about the b section the outro really nothing too crazy just a more simplified version of what was going on here 
couple reuses of some of the other sound effects from the intro, right now outro. Oh yeah, and right over here, uh, so I was trying to get the um, a, a delay effect with this. Uh, I was trying to use Ableton's Echo or their delay, but I couldn't get it to like have the same syncopation that I wanted it to, uh, so I just did it manually. Um, and that was a little bit more work, but uh, it's exactly the way I want it to sound, so uh, I think it was worth it. Um, worth the extra time. Uh, so right here, this, I believe, is a... Yeah, this is just like a, a duplicated track of that one bass fill that you hear in several other places in the song, but... Uh, you know, over time, I I just kind of mimic what a ping pong delay would sound like by duplicating the audio samples. I do this a lot in other tracks too. If I have like a weird time delay or want to add some more rhythmic elements, but I can't mimic it with a echo or a grain delay or whatever else, um, it can be a bit tedious. But yeah, like I said, I think it's worth the extra effort.